And welcome to St. John's. This is a place where grace abounds. Grace abounds for us. And it's ninth Sunday after Pentecost. We have a very familiar story in our gospel text today. The disciples are out on the boat of the Sea of Galilee. Guess what kicks up? A storm. And they're terrified and you know, they're, they're making headway painfully. And Jesus comes to them on the water, speaks words of comfort to them, and gets in the boat with them. The winds die down and they make it safely to shore. This is what Jesus does for us here in this place. He speaks words of comfort to us. Take heart. It is I do not be afraid. And he even gets in the boat with us. All right? And it takes us safely to the shore of eternal life. And, uh, the boat that is, that is him. Today, the only answer really that I have uh, is just about our service. The, the psalm today is from Psalm 136. And uh, the refrain is the constant, for his steadfast love endures forever. For his steadfast love endures forever. So when we get to the psalm, um, I'm going to split it up by half verse. I'll speak the first part of the verse, and I'll have you all respond with the refrain, for his steadfast love endures forever. Uh, and also, I know our hymn of the day today is one that you probably don't recognize, but the words were just too good today. So um, if nothing else, Listen to the words in our, in our hymn of the day. Um, but certainly, of course, we get a hand of tune uh, sing along to that. Let us begin with prayer. Good and gracious God, we thank you once again for bringing us here into this place. We thank you for all the many gifts that you give us, especially the gifts of your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for us and rose from the dead. Focus our eyes on him today. We thank you that he speaks to us words of comfort with us wherever we go. Send your spirit to us. Guide us in all truth today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing our opening hymn, God Himself is present.
beginning of time, God has revealed his will to seek and to save that which was lost. No matter how often we have entered the gates of God's place, whether often or rarely, because of sin we are all lost on our own and helpless. Let us therefore approach God in humility to receive his forgiveness. O oh God, I believe in you. O oh Lord, I trust your promise to save me. Forgive me for my sins in thought, word, and deed. Come to me, though I am not worthy. Come to me with your promise, with your touch of forgiveness, healing, help, and life. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. God has come to you in grace and mercy. Upon this, your confession is a called and ordained servant to the Word and by His authority. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, the protector of all who trust in you. Strengthen our faith and give us courage to believe that in your love you will rescue us from all adversities. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the readings of God's Word. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all the flesh. And the water shall never again be is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Our psalm today is Psalm 136, verses 1 through 9. Again, I'll speak the first half of the verse and I'll have you respond with the second half for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders. To him who by understanding made the heavens. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights. For his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day. For his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and stars to rule over the night. For his steadfast love endures forever. The epistle reading today is taken from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. For this reason I quote, bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ, Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to 
him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. We stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplace places and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched it were made well. This is the Gospel of the Lord. May we see you for our end of the day.
read these verses from the end of chapter 1, verses 22 through 23. It says, And he, the Father, put all things under his feet, that is Christ's feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Jesus was crucified for you. He was raised from the dead for you, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. His rule and his reign are eternal, and they are above every authority, every power, and every dominion. Through your baptism, uh, you have been placed into Christ. You are a member of his church, his body, of which he is the head. And Paul tells us he has all things under his feet. How many things? I said, dear church, how many things? Oh. All things under his feet, all sin, all sickness, all powers, all situations, all death, the evil one. It's all under his feet. And I ask the question, what does that mean for you? What does that mean for you to know that Jesus has all things under his feet. I want you to think about that for a little bit. We'll come back to that question. Because knowing Jesus, knowing who Jesus is and what he has done for you, changes everything. That question, I thought, fit pretty well with our gospel text this morning. Again, it's a familiar story. The disciples are out on the Sea of Galilee. A storm kicks up and Jesus walks to them on the water. This is the same account, by the way, where Peter called out to Jesus and walked out to him, uh, but Jesus saved him from drowning. And uh, since Mark's gospel was informed by Peter, I can't help but think that Peter just conveniently left that detail out. Like, ah, Matthew's got that part covered. Let's just stick to the basics. But anyway, our text for this morning immediately follows the miraculous feeding if you remember, it had been a long day. The disciples had gone off to a, a desolate place to rest, but the crowds followed Jesus. They followed him, and at the end of the day, they're cleaning up breadcrumbs. And so Jesus sent his disciples, again, after this long day, to Bethsaida by sea, and he went up on a mountain to pray. And even though they had separated for the time being, Jesus never lost sight of them. And if you can picture this, the, the Sea of Galilee, it's not that big. I'm glad it's the longest. It's only about 13 miles long, and the distance to their destination from where they were was only about five miles. So the journey was short, but when you've got the wind against you, it's like driving on the Cross Bronx during rush hour. And they were making headway painfully. <laughs> the disciples were still battling the wind at the watch of the night, Mark tells us, which is around 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. It's been a long day. Now again, Jesus saw them the entire time. And that's significant. In the Old Testament, only one woman names God. That woman was Hagar, Sarah's servant, who bore Abraham's son Ishmael. After Hagar and Ishmael were driven out uh, from the, the camp by Sarah, God still provided for them. And Hagar said to God in Genesis 16, 13, You are a God of seeing. Or you are a God who sees me. Jesus is that God. The God who sees his disciples caught in a storm, caught in a, in a bad situation, and he sees them and acts for them. The God who sees us in our pain and our sin and our suffering, this is Jesus. And all these occasions are opportunities for faith in him. For he is the only one who has the power to save. See, our text says, And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. 
But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and they cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. That phrase, that, catch that phrase, is a little weird. He meant to pass by them. What does that mean? It might, it might actually sound a little familiar. Something maybe you've heard in a few Old Testament texts before. On a few notable occasions, God did just that. He passed by, or passed before, as a divine revelation. For example, uh, in Exodus 34, after Moses had broken the first set of stone tablets containing the commandments, uh, God told him to make two more tablets of stone, and he was going to write the commandments again. In that story, God descended in a cloud, stood with Moses, and the text says that he passed before him, proclaiming his steadfast love and forgiveness. And Moses' reaction is important. He recognized the Lord as he passed by. He bowed his head and he worshipped. Another example is from 1 Kings 19. This is the chapter that immediately follows that. The prophet showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Uh, this is the one where uh, you know, they, they set up two altars, and the prophets of Baal are trying to get Baal to burn the altar and burn the, the sacrifice. But uh, Elijah makes fun of them and says, maybe your God's going to the bathroom. He actually says that. Uh, and, uh, of course, Baal never shows up because Baal doesn't exist. But then Elijah gets up and... God proves to be the one true God by consuming everything that Elijah had put out there. So after that story, the prophets of Baal are slaughtered. Jezebel doesn't take too kindly to that, seeks Elijah's life. Elijah runs, and it's there in a cave, at the mouth of a cave, that God passes by him. And like Moses, Elijah recognized the Lord. And like Moses, he hid his face. In both of these instances, God passing by was a divine revelation, inviting faith during difficult circumstances. And that's what's going on in our gospel text this morning. The God who sees wanted his disciples to see him. But not just as this guy who is feeding 5,000, is a miracle worker or feeder, not just as a teacher or as a healer, but as the Lord of all creation. He meant to pass by them as this divine revelation, just as he had passed by Moses and Elijah, so that they would recognize him and believe that the one true God saw them, was with them, and was for them. But, as our text puts it, he meant to pass by them. The disciples did not react like Moses or Elijah, and they certainly didn't recognize Jesus as the Lord of all creation. I'm not sure if Mark intended it this way, but to me this scene is almost comical. The disciples are exhausted and battling the storm for hours. They're worried about the wind and the waves. They're, their hearts are hard, and they're, they're not really thinking in terms of Jesus is going to save me. Um, and Jesus meant to pass by them to put their hearts at ease. But they become even more terrified because now, on top of everything else, on top of the storm, on top of the tiredness and everything, they've got ghosts to worry about. I know this didn't happen, but I imagine in my mind's eye, Jesus rubbing the bridge of his nose just a little bit. Again, that didn't happen. But he did immediately speak to them. And he said, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased. If you don't buy the humor of the story, you can't miss the irony. The disciples are the ones who failed to recognize Jesus. But as soon as they reached land on the shore of Gennesaret, immediately the crowds recognized him. And they brought their sick to him, and 
And wherever he went, Jesus couldn't catch a break. They were bringing sick to him, that people were touching even the, the fringe of his garments, and they were being healed. That's a sign. This is what it's meant by when Jesus has healing in his wings. You heard that phrase, Jesus has healing in his wings. Jesus ain't a bird. What is, what is going on here? That phrase that literally means in his tassels, in the fringe of his garments, Jesus has healing. And that's what's going on here. The disciples might have missed the divine revelation. And the crowds recognized, but they might have missed the whole picture. But for you, dear friends, Jesus has revealed himself to you. Who he is. And he's revealed himself who he is through his word. It's all right there for us in the scriptures. Even our short text this morning reveals much about who Jesus is. He's the God who sees. The same God of the Old Testament who saw Hagar and provided for her and Ishmael. He's the God who speaks words of comfort and peace, even when we fail to recognize. He's a healer, a miraculous feeder and teacher. He's the God who passed by Moses and Elijah, revealed to himself as the one true God, and he is the Lord of all creation. And through this word, this Jesus has revealed himself as the God who came to save us. Ultimately, this is who our God is. He came to bear your sin on the cross and suffer God's wrath in your place so that you would have nothing to fear. In his death, he calmed the loud winds of accusation and stilled the powerful waves of your guilt, shame, and fear. He came to save you from your sin, but also from all that your sin and the sins of others have done to you and to this world. Everything was created through him, and it is all redeemed through him. Jesus has even saved you from the power of the devil and from death itself. And as Jesus taught and fed and healed and, and passed by and walked on the water, he was giving the crowds and the disciples and us a foretaste of what is to come on the last day. This Jesus has come to make all things new, restoring what was lost, healing what is broken, and wiping away every tear from Jesus comes to you again now, today, here in this place, not on the Sea of Galilee or on the shores of Gennesaret, but in his word. And through his word, he reveals who he is. He is your Savior. He is your Lord. And he has. How many things under his feet? All things under his feet. And that Jesus the Jesus into whom you were baptized is in the boat with you. So I ask again, what does it mean for you to know that Jesus has all things under his feet? What changes now that you know and are reminded that the one who has all power and authority is your Savior and your Lord? Do you feel more hopeful? Do you smile a little bit more? Do you feel more courageous? Do you feel free? Do you know that you are loved beyond measure and nothing, not even death, can take you out of God's hands? Because he has all things under his feet. Do you feel more confident about bringing your prayers and your requests to God? Maybe you'll want to spend less time worrying about what you're reading in the news. Maybe the things that they worked up will start to lose their power and their influence over you. And maybe you'll feel a renewed sense of wanting to open up your Bible, wanting to grow deeper in the knowledge of Christ and be filled with the richness of his mercy and grace for you. What does it mean for you that Jesus has all things under his feet? Friends, I pray that you walk out of those doors this morning, knowing that the Lord of all creation, who sees you 
and loves you and who died and rose for you and who has all things under his feet is with you and for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. Let us confess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God, very God, begotten not made. Being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is spoken by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sin. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Eternal Father, O God, our Creator and Redeemer, we thank you that you have drawn us to yourself by the power of your word and our Savior Jesus Christ our Lord. For your promises of life and salvation, we give you praise and adoration as our God and Lord. Keep us in steady faith in you. Guide our steps in the ways of your life-giving word, and make us to be ever more your people of hope, love, and life. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus, as you strengthened your early apostles by your very presence, so give strength and courage to church workers who continue in your service to this day. Guard and protect them from the assault of the devil, and bless their service in your word and sacraments. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, give your blessing and guidance to all in authority in the service of government in our land and throughout the world. Cause them to pursue righteousness and justice in all their dealings, that we may live in prosperity and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Give healing and comfort, O oh Lord to all who are in trouble, danger, or illness, especially Jane Wicks, Linda Funch, Allison, Nancy Gaines, Anita Heaton, Barbara Stanson, Johnny Liskey, Kevin Tom, Kathy Bruno, Michelle P, Cassie Wood, Dan Carabillo, Erica Brody, Terry Myers, Thomas Malcolm, Haley, Fred, family and friends of Robert Cornwell, and those we name in our hearts. Sustain their courage and faith in your mighty care. Lord, in your mercy. In your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I ask you now to take out your communion cups as we prepare to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. 
that same Jesus who was walking on the water that day at the Sea of Galilee to strengthen the faith of his disciples has come here to this place in this bread and this wine to forgive our sins, strengthen our faith, and keep us in him until life everlasting. We ask you to hold them out. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. We open the bread together. Take me the body of Christ. Continue with our closing here. 